Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everybody, I'm Junior Doan. Welcome to Uncommon Sense, and thank you for joining us today. My guest is Sharon Miller. Sharon is owner of the Immediate Temporary Help Services in Midland, which she opened in 1973. Sharon is also the president of Midland Morning Rodeo, of which I'm a member. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you. Well, tell me about this business you've been in for more than a couple of decades. Well, you know, I started in business because I had two young children and I wanted to have some control over my schedule. Little did I know that the c schedule would have control over me, but it's been a wonderful 40 plus years. And how did you pick this particular area? I identified a need and uh, I just opened up a business. I did not have past experience in, in the staffing company at all. Had you worked before? I worked, but not in staffing. You worked in what kinds of things? I was in the medical field, and I, and I was a department head in a hospital. Uh, like in nursing or managing uh, or? It was in uh, electrocardiogram, electroencephalogram in the, a lab. That is really a huge step. It was a big step. It was a, a, a giant leap. Uh, were there competitors in the field at the time? At the time, there was a competitor in Saginaw, maybe two, and none in Midland. And, you know, at the time, I didn't think about competitors. No one said you can't or you shouldn't, and so I just forged ahead. And how, what will, break it down, what was the forging encompassing? Well, the forging was in 1973, it was still a man's world. And I was young, much younger than I am now. And it was one of those things that um, many people perceived that I was just, it was a hobby and not, and not a profession. And so uh, it took a while to establish myself and have credibility in what I was doing and, and have people recognize that I, that I had uh, the power to, to work with people and identify needs and match the needs and the skills together. And how did you um, attract people to be placed? Well, you know, there's a variety, and that really hasn't changed that much other than the technology. But it's all about networking and putting the word out there on what you need and identifying what you need and then doing the good old-fashioned interviewing and making sure that people understand what is expected of them. And you obviously uh, check background and skill and you skill check them if it's someone that you, a skill you can check. But now today, you know, we have um, many websites. We we do interviews electronically. Uh, we do we interview Skype. Uh, we do videos and send them off to the employers so they can see the employee before they get there. Obviously, 40 years ago, we didn't do any of that kind of thing. But it was a a more personal endeavor 40 years ago. And how did you inquire, acquire clients, that is to say, places that were looking for people? I went out and I asked. It was, you know, again, I didn't come from a marketing background at that time. And so I would call people and ask. And many times it was an educational process on letting people know at that time that they could have someone to fill in for a maternity leave or for an illness or a project. And so it was a, it's a, it was a learning experience, a growing experience, and, and I took anything, uh, any course I could take, any seminar I could go to that would tell me how to market. You know, I hear the work ethic is different than from now. Have, what have you noticed? Well, it's so much different. I don't, you know, uh, it, people are more apt to tell you when they can work rather than ask you when you would like them to work. There's a, a big difference there. Uh, people are not as willing to put themselves out, I will say. Uh, when, when I started, if you wanted a job, you did what the employer asked you to do, and you worked the hours they asked you to do, 
uh, to work, and now it is I can work from this time till this time and on this day, and I need to work around whatever else is going on in your life. And, and it's more possible now because uh, there is so much flexibility in the work world. Mm -hmm. And um, how do you check on a person uh, that they are good character? Because we, I now understand there are all sorts of laws you can't check. We, we ask them to sign a release, and we do a background check on everyone. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we do check um, for criminal and, you know, that kind of thing. And then we still use the good old-fashioned reference checking, and we call people. And sometimes people are very willing to talk, but most of the time, and it seems the bigger the company, the more apt they are to say, we will verify employment dates. And oh. so, but they don't verify anything else because, again, the laws have changed so much that no one wants to, you know, cause more burden to themselves. So it's very interesting. Um, and a lot of it is you use your brain and you use your stomach. <laughs> and if it doesn't feel right, it usually isn't right. <laughs> and is there a difference in what the employer is looking for today than long ago? Yes, um, they expect them to be far um, more ready to come in and work. Uh, a long time ago, it would be they might ask you to come in and file, or they would ask you to do uh, some kind of uh, clerical work, but always under the tutelage of someone else. And now they expect you to be able to come in, sit down, go into the programs, and just you know, move forward. And if, if you're an engineer, they expect you to come in and do project management if that's what they hire you for. There's very little uh, lead time. Mm -hmm. Not to have that year-long training that I just talked about. <laughs> that's right, <laughs> that's right. exposure. And so do you find yourself in the education business then for some of your applicants? Very definitely. We have to tell people how to dress, how to respond. Um, you know, many times an empl an, a potential employee, when asked what they're looking for, goes, I don't know. Well, you have to know if you want to impress someone. And it's not, it's not the applicant or the candidate's fault, really. It's that they've never been in that position before. So you, you coach, I call it coaching rather than educating. And so you coach them and you coach them on what to dress like and, and h how to respond and talk about what they have done. A resume gives you a highlight, but it certainly doesn't uh, let someone know the skills you have. So we coach them in what to say to the, to the, to the employer when they're, if they're interviewing them. Are, uh, are things like being an extrovert or an introvert, are those part of the things to consider for a particular placement? Well, it is, but you have to, ma and, and that's our part, because we have to match the the potential applicant candidate up to the employer because employers come in introverts and extroverts also. Yeah. And so if, if you've got a real bubbly, happy person and you put them in an area where it's a real introvert, uh, it's not going to be a good match. Uh, it'll, you know, I mean, if it's a very quiet, subdued place, then you try to find a quiet, subdued person. Um, you know, people can come with skills, but, but the personal aspects of their uh, personality, um, you can't teach those and you can teach skills. So um, personality and all, that means uh, <laughs> that human relationships are the basic. You have to get those right. You, that's correct. You still have to, uh, you still have to know people, you still have to give them an opportunity to talk and let them tell you what they want to tell you, and then usually that's a good indicator of what, how they will perform on the job. If they tell you everything about their personal life, they're probably gonna tell you everything about their personal life regardless of what the setting is. If they tell you nothing, not even how, you know, where they live almost, uh, they'll probably tell you nothing when they get to the job site. And so that's a, that's a call on our part of, uh, we evaluate people on and how friendly they are, what they look like, um, were they, do they have the right skills, and so it all goes into the mix. Oh, interesting. And what kind of family uh, did you come from in terms of teaching people skills? What, what did your parents emphasize? 
Well, my mother was a war bride, and she came over here uh, as a war bride and was always the wife and mother in the home, did not work out. And my dad came from a farming background and ended up working at General Motors, and he was a very hard worker. He taught us that you work hard and you give uh, your employer uh, everything that they're paying you and more. You always become an asset to that employer. But I had no one in my family that came from uh, a business background or a public uh, arena at all. They were just good, hardworking people. Do you think uh, that desire to do something was there earlier than being a mom and wanting to provide, so to speak? Well, I always wanted to help other people. And I was the oldest in the family, so I took that oldest role very seriously. I, it wasn't something I was aware of, but I certainly filled that role. And so as I got into the workplace, I was always the one that was uh, planning the baby shower and the birthday party and sending out cards if someone was sick. So I think that was pretty natural. And I really went into uh, business without giving it a lot of thought. It was filling my need. Interesting. How many siblings do you have? I have a sister and a brother. Oh, nice. Years yeah. of practice. Yes, yes. Oh, very interesting. Well, you have a wonderful reputation, and I think that's something we all cherish, I mean, should cherish from ourselves. What makes for a good reputation? I think you live the talk. Uh, you know, I, I try to give back. I try to be out there in the community. I try to coach less, and for, less fortunate because I know that I've been blessed in many ways. Uh, and so I just keep working to work with others. Um, no is a difficult word for me to say, but with age that has gotten somewhat better. Um, so I, I just believe that uh, you, you, give, you give back and keep working hard and it, all, you know, it, it will play out. You know, we all have uh, times in our life where we face challenges. And I think that, that sometimes people watch how you face the challenges more, much closer than how you face the easy times. You know, for myself, I try never to be a victim. Whatever happens, <laughs> I just say, okay, what do I have to do? You know, what, what, what just happened? What do I need? Because life is what we choose and what we don't choose. And uh, I feel that's very strengthening. You know, because that I have always, not always, because I think when I started as a child, it was always pointing fingers and that kind of thing, but that's useless. And the idea of handling things under high stress, those appear as we all have. So you might as well um, see them through. Now I know some people say they can't or it's overwhelming, but when I think of people who went through the concentration camps of Europe and then had to start over in a different language in a different country, I, you know, I, uh, I am in admiration of that kind of thing. And I think Midland's a wonderful place to run a business. I do too. Because you're well known enough, uh, but big enough to have draw. And we, and we all, you know, we all make choices, going back to what you were saying, and I, and I believe you can make a choice to deal with what's presented to you and move forward as you suggested you do, or you can make a choice to feel sorry for yourself, and you get nowhere go feeling sorry for yourself. So you just use it as a, another lesson of life, and you move forward with it. You know, the hardest thing for me is to maintain balance. <laughs> Because, you know, I think, sometimes I think um, just maintaining balance within yourself and within what's happening in your life, and when you get a, a blow of any kind, it, at least it throws me off balance, and how, how do you come back to, um, to balance? When I was young, I never thought anyone had a problem, but you see, <laughs> now it's just chapters <laughs> at different times. And your children, what, ha what happened to them? Are they here? I have two children, and one is in, they're both in Michigan, and they're both successful, and uh, they, they are both married and have children of their own, and my children have kept me balanced, and now my grandchildren keep me balanced, because when things are, are bad, you just look around and you, and you give thanks for the family you have, and, and know that uh, if you turn your head one way or the other, you see someone who's struggling with more than you ever could struggle with, 
And so the children are definitely a very important part in my life. What did you have to learn about being a grandmother? Well, first of all, I had to learn that being a grandmother is totally different than being a mother. Yes. <laughs> so grandmothers are able to indulge. And, you know, my clock stops when I'm with my grandchildren. Um, we do things they want to do or things that I think they should be exposed to. And I don't worry about if the laundry's done or, um, you know, we, uh, we don't worry. If, if I, I, don't, I wouldn't go to the supermarket while they were there unless they wanted to go. I mean, I would wait until after they left. And so we, I'm, I'm more playful with my grandchildren than I was my children. Oh, oh interesting. Now, do you give your daughter advice? Um, when asked, I try very carefully. I tell my friends that I bite my cheeks a lot because I, I didn't want advice from my mother or my, you know, uh, the grandparents, and I try to be respectful of my children in the same way. That's a personality change. It is. Control, <laughs> like a girdle. And that's why I bite my cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a new grandmother, and I'm asking myself, what do I need to learn that's different? And one of the things that I have said is I don't have to feel responsible and be a problem solver on everything. <laughs> That's right. You can play with them. You can have fun. And then they go home to their parents. Yeah. So they come up periodically or you go down? Uh, they come and visit me more than I, I mean, we, we do it both ways. But um, when they travel, I go to Disney World with them. Uh, oh, that's I've, nice. they're, they're into skiing, they're into dancing, and I have one, that's a, one grandchild that's into modeling and acting. And so I accompany them, not all the time, but from time to time, to their events, and, and that's just so much fun. Do you ever feel you want to protect them from the culture? I worry about the burden that they're going to have as they grow. I, I feel that my children and other, my grandchildren and others like them have more and more responsibility than I did at that age as far as, you know, it's so important that they are achievers. It's so important that they, that they get uh, the best possible grades in school and go on and do something that will serve the country and, and the world. And I worry about that responsibility. Uh, but I think their parents balance that out with the activities that they're involved in because they have lots of activities that are stress relievers, such as the skiing and swimming and tennis and, and the things that maybe as a child uh, we didn't have as much of. Right. More go outside and play. That's right. That's <laughs> right. And come back for dinner. Right. When the bell rang. Yeah. <laughs> oh, interesting. So how do you personally hire people to work with you? I do a personality profile. Mm -hmm. I have done one, I've had one done on myself, and then we do it on our uh, people that are going to work in our office, because I think it's really important that we have to be able to work with each other. Uh, it's, a, it's very important that we can understand each other's styles, and there's not a right and a wrong style, they're just different styles. Which, which test do you use? Um, or maybe you don't want to say? I prefer not to say, because don't everyone, say. okay. No. It's, uh, I have a friend who practices on me on everything she wants to learn. <laughs> and so uh, I begin to see new ways of doing things or along these lines because of being a guinea pig for her. Well, her when interest. I understand their strengths and their weaknesses, then I understand how to approach them on different uh, areas. Yes, yes. Some people can take surprise and some people can't, or right. direction. And some people need constant reinforcement, and other people don't operate under the, all that reinforcement. They want to be self-directed. Oh, interesting. Now, you've been very involved in the community, uh, certainly Rotary, but some of the other things you've done are what? Well, I, I've been chair of uh, Small Business Association of Michigan and the National Small Business Association, and locally, the Arnold Center, Oh, Pulse, really? Pulse 3 Foundation, Saginaw Business and Education Partnership, um, the Bay Area Women's Center for, uh, sh it's a shelter house for abused women, and very involved in Zanta and Rotary. And, uh, you know, over a 40-year span, you have a lot of time to be involved in a lot of things. And right now, you're the boss of Maud. <laughs> <laughs> what would you like to see in the morning Rotary program? Well, I, I think our programming is one of our strengths in the Morning Rotary. We have 
diverse speakers, um, and we go from what's going on in the school system to what new businesses are coming to town. Uh, last week, um, we had a, a program on childhood grief and how uh, an organization helps children who have lost someone significant get through it. Uh, so it's that kind of, of diversity. And our membership, we have people in their 20s and people in their 90s, and they sit at the table with each other on a weekly basis and we learn from each other, and it's a, a lighthearted and fun group. We do wonderful things for the community. We have community projects, and we help with uh, the bell ringing and the Thanksgiving meals and uh, projects like that throughout the year, and they vary according to the needs, but some are, are annual events. And, and we do clean water and sanitation, on a, on a global level, um, support projects through our Rotary International. And you know it's a natural evolution of leadership for younger people, and you've got mentors there. And so I think in Rotary is for men and women and all uh, classifications. So I just think it's an excellent uh, program to be in. And Morning Rotary is small enough so you can really know people it's seven how many are in morning about row? between 55 and 60 oh. and yes and it's been going since the late 1980 well like 89 or 90 and um, and it's um, it's the younger group there's two rotary clubs in Midland and the morning rotary is the younger the smaller group but it's very fun it's not um, we're not as steeped in tradition uh, by which you mean you're more willing to do what uh, we're very flexible, yeah, and there's uh, room for uh, new members to get very involved and take on leadership roles very early on, and I think we're very open for, for new ideas and new ways of doing things. You know, one of the advantages of Rotary, as you know, and also the obligation of Rotary is when you're not in town, you need to go to a meeting in whatever area you are. And I have periodically done that because I'm here and there. And I learned so much about the, uh, the club I'm visiting, the town I'm visiting that way. What are their concerns? Who needs? Who wants? What, you know, what's coming up? It's, you can never not feel part of a community that you really are not part of if you go to Rotary and go to a Rotary meeting. Rotary is a fellow fellowship, and that's right. You could be in any town, anywhere, and if there's a Rotary Club, you could make contact and you would feel welcome at the meeting. And if you had questions about the community or what to do next, someone in that uh, uh, group would either tell you or lead you to someone that could help you. I, I, it's just, it's very remarkable. I was surprised at, at how tight, I'll use, uh, Rotarians are with each other. Yes, and I went to one in New York uh, a while back, and the woman I was sitting next to was the ex-president of back a few years. And she said when she was president, it was 2001, and that Rotary worked with the police and the fire and you know the other people to try and support the effort that needed to be taken down in Lower Manhattan uh, due to these attacks. And it, you know, it, it, it's, it's, everything is sometimes not seen, you know, and, but it, it's so American, it's so wonderful that we really volunteer and we make ourselves useful personally and through an institution like Rotary. Rotary presents themselves where there's a need. And it doesn't matter if it's for high school children on, on the last day of school at an all-night party, feeding them and staying with them to keep them safe off the roads, <clears throat> or if it's for people who, who can't afford to buy Thanksgiving dinners, or if it's people in third world countries that, that do not have latrines or do not have wells, you know, uh, teaching them how to wash their hands. Uh, so Rotary's where the need is, not, not just one area, but it's uh, uh, worldwide and it's ageless. Um, so what would you say to a young person who might be interested in joining Rotary, for example? Would, would they call you? Do, do, how, how would you even know? I would say come to the Midland Country Club at 645 on any Tuesday, and you will be made welcome. Uh, you will learn a lot. You will meet new people and have new friends. Uh, it's a very welcoming group, and uh, it's just a wonderful way to learn leadership skills. What are leadership skills encompassing? 
taking charge of projects, uh, taking responsibility, working with people from a, uh, many different facets of life, working with people that are higher on the scale than you and lower on the scale than you. How do you lead when you've got people that have been in the workforce for 30 years and you might be in the workforce for five years? Oh, interesting. Well, thank you, Sharon. So, well, leadership, need, originality, starting when you don't know very much about it. Sharon is a wonderful example of how <laughs> she converted first, uh, first child experiences um, to going out and really creating a business that had not been here before and successfully over a long time period. And as times change, you have to change the business somewhat. And the support system, although it basically handles the same kind of need, there's a great deal of um, <clears throat> things you'd want to emphasize, and that is join the community, that is be good, that is be loving, uh, that is be, be, do your part, be responsible, and at all times, at all times, um, uh, what I want to say, to say, show goodwill, be goodwill. So I'm very happy to have the chance to talk to Karen, uh, Sharon, and I'm very happy to wish you a wonderful week. Go out and be responsible. I love talking with all of you, and I'll talk to you very soon. Thank you so very much for tuning in, and I will see you next week. To contact Junia, send her an email at info at juniadone.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadone.com. Thanks for joining us. See you next time for Uncommon Sense with Junia Doan. Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.